Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the bridge, guys. We're glad you're here this morning. I know I was a little slow coming in this morning, and normally I get to pray with uh, the worship team that's here and the greeting team that's out front, sometimes security team members, and I didn't get a chance to do that this morning, so if you all would just, uh, could I just pray with everybody here this morning? Let's pray. Father God, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be just with church family this morning. What a gift you've given us to be able to gather and to hear testimonies of your work in our lives. God, you are already victorious. Your word is victorious, but we're still in process and we're still seeing things happen day by day that sometimes we doubt, we struggle. We go through things sometimes with confidence, sometimes with uh, uh, opposite feelings. And God, I just pray this morning that we would see you and we would see your promises, and that we would be reminded of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. God, I pray for your spirit to lead during this time, through all the teams that are here, through the congregation that's assembled. Father, I pray for the children's ministry workers this morning, that uh, your word would shine forth through their lives and their love and their service to those children. God, I pray that the children would speak in ways that would witness your glory to those workers. And God, I just thank you for the many ways that you speak through your church. I pray for you to speak today through me and through your word. And I pray that you would speak to us who are speaking. And that we would be led by your spirit. Feel your anointing presence. That your spirit would continue to testify with our spirits that we are your children. Children of promise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So for a call to worship this morning, I want to point you to... Revelation chapter 21, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. And at my house, there is a uh, countdown clock that's going on until my daughter's wedding. And we've got 13 days before she's going to be married off. And it's not a clock, I'm sorry. It's a, a chalkboard. My wife keeps checking the days off. And 13 days. And uh, we're looking forward to that. That's something that we're hopeful about, we're excited about. Um, And so in the call to worship today, I just want to bring that up because sometimes in this life, some of those things I prayed about, the struggle of life, we can forget that this is not all that we're made for. I watched a a really sad movie the other day. Uh, My son had seen it weeks ago and he told me about it and he said, you should check it out. And I watched it and I was like, oh my goodness, that was such a heavy, sad movie. And whenever it was over, I sent, it, I sent him, hey, that was sad. Just, I love you, son. I'm, <laughs> I'm not taking for granted these things. But we've had those conversations. And he sent back, yeah, that's such a good movie. And I was just going to tell you guys, like, so many times we'll have those conversations with people uh, where something's just really sad and it seems almost like to the point of despair. Like, what is there to hope for? And we need to be reminded of this scripture we're about to read. I want to set that up for you because that's how God had prepared my heart to receive it as well. So when I read this scripture, remember, this is not all that we're made for. And we who are in Christ have a hope that is secure and it's eternal and it's of peace with God forevermore. And guys, that is guaranteed and secured. And no matter what broken experience we go through in this life, it can't be removed. It can't be undone because it's promised in God. So we're going to be talking a lot today about the promises of God, being children of promise. But I think this scripture points up to that promise that we're looking toward. So let me read this. And then, guys... Everything that happens from here on out in this worship experience, this team is prepared, they've prayed, the the words that are on the screens, the prayers that are offered, these are to point us to faith in Jesus Christ. I need that. You need that. So today when you stand, even if you can't sing loudly, say these things as a prayer for your soul to be reminded what God is promising to do in your life. So let me read this from Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth has passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, 
coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. That's a sure word from the Lord that you and I can bank on today. Doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. That word is to give you hope that if you place your faith in Jesus Christ, there's nothing more secure and solid than that. That is the anchor that we need for our souls. And so this morning, you're invited to see that. I invite you to stand, welcome your neighbor, and then we're going to join together in this worship. Thanks, guys. Lift your voices with us, friends, as we sing. And the angels cry, holy, all creation cries, holy, you are lifted high, holy, holy forever. A thousand generations. Thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all have gone before us, and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest, your name. Is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your Jesus 
God is a holy God. He, that means that he is high and lifted up and separate from us. He's so different than us. And, and it should cause us to say, how could I ever know this God? How could I come to him? How could I be right before him? This next song we're about to sing says, how great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. There's a chasm between us and God. He is, he is high and we can't climb up to him on our own, but God, good news, God has done everything so that chasm could be bridged and so that, and he came down to us in Jesus. He came down from the mountain. So we want to rejoice in that together, that he has done everything so that we sinful people could know that holy God. Christ. 
to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the good how good it is to just rejoice in Jesus together with brothers and sisters this morning to just boast in Jesus and what he has done he alone could save us he alone could bring us to you this holy God we boast in the roaring lion who trampled death and won the victory for us we boast in that together this morning God we just want to ask you to continue to be with us as you're already with us, already bringing us in worship to yourself. We're so thankful for that. Uh, We're thankful for our kids' ministry, those who serve there, and we just ask your blessing on them as they serve and your blessing on these kids as they hear your word. May, May you be there and present and working in their hearts. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We'll have our kids be dismissed at this time. As they're heading out, just this next song, I want us to just continue to do what we've already been doing and just rejoicing in what Jesus has done together. I'd like to read just a few verses from Galatians chapter 4 because they're familiar because we just were in this text a couple weeks ago, but just a rich few verses of who of what Jesus has done for us. Galatians 4, verses 4 to 7, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Amen. Let's rejoice in what Jesus has done. This next song we sing, 
And because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. And God the just is satisfied to look on him, look on Jesus and pardon us. Pardon me. that's what our hearts are pouring forth to you. Praise 
to the one risen Son of God. We praise what Jesus, praise you for what Jesus has done. We thank you that, that you look on Jesus, his finished work, his righteousness, his death and resurrection. By, by faith, you put us in him and we are one with him and you see his righteousness when you look at us. You're satisfied. You are just and satisfied to look on us and pardon, look on him and pardon us. We thank you, God. God, we thank you for being here present with us. God, work through John as he brings the word to us. Work in our hearts. We cannot live out your word apart from you. We need you to live out your word. Would you help us for your glory? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Before John comes and brings the word, he's asked me to read the text this morning. So if you have your Bibles or phones or devices, you can go to Galatians chapter 4 or just listen to me as I read. Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 to 31. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more, will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac... Our children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. Amen. Father God, we thank you for just this word of scripture, this word of truth. God, we have hearts that are deceiving us moment by moment, day by day, and it's only by the light that you shine on them that we can see truth, that we can hear truth. Thank you for the words that you've given that Joe has read this morning that are written to the church in Galatia, but they're written for all Christians for all time. God, help us to hear these words and to settle into that truth, to believe that truth, and to cling to that truth as if our very lives depended on it. God, we love you. We respond this morning accordingly to the great love you've shown to us with hearts full of passion and emotion for those of us who have experienced salvation already and look forward to the eternal salvation to come. God, I pray that for anyone who does not know you in this space, in this world, that you would begin now to move on their hearts in ways that they would see and hear these words as truth for their lives so that they would be known to you as children of promise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, guys, we've been in the study of Galatians for a little bit. And um, it's, it's, again, today we're in verses 21 through 31, like Joe had read this morning. Appreciate that. Um, this, this has been... Uh, a progression of just parts of a whole. The book of Galatians was written to, to Christians who, some were Christians who were struggling with what do we do with the law? Do we go back to it? Do we try to do some of it? Do we do all of it? Or is Christ enough? And Paul is reminding them that Jesus is enough. There's nothing else that needs to be added. The law was purposefully pointing to our inability to save ourselves, but it also fulfilled a time where it pointed to people to have faith in that God would provide a Messiah to come, a salvation to come. And so the law was there. It is there to reveal a need for the Messiah, and the Messiah has come. And Paul wants to remind the church that this is where our faith 
rest. This is what makes us children of promise, is our faith in Jesus Christ, the one whom God provided, the perfect spotless lamb, the perfect sacrifice once for all. This is the one that God provided and that we are to put our faith in and trust in. And it's a serious matter. It's important for us to take it. I think for a lot of us, we hear these things from Galatians and we might think, that don't really apply to me because I'm a Christian. I want you to hear that this applies to Christians still today. And, and I shared with this in the men's Bible study group this week that this still applies to me. I've been a Christian for many years. I'm growing and learning in my faith in Jesus Christ. But this still applies to me because sometimes we hear the law and we don't understand what it's saying. We seek to go to some other way. And, and one of the ways it was explained this week that I thought was helpful, and I had this years ago in some of the training that I've been through in, in gospel, gospel training through a church that I was a part of in St. Louis. And that church, what they asked is this question, and Kim might remember this too, when we first moved to the area and we joined that church, one of the first questions in that class was, are you a rule breaker or a rule follower? And for me, that might seem like such an easy answer, and my kids always make fun of me because I'm like, well, I think I'm a little bit rule breaker, a little bit rule follower, and they always make fun of me. You can't be all things, Dad. But in that situation, and maybe you can relate a little bit, I was like, that's kind of hard for me to answer because I can gravitate one way or another at any point in my life. And they asked the question, and this did help me. They said, are you a person who's more likely, if you see a sign that says keep off the grass, to keep off the grass, and I am. That's my nature. Now, that's not everyone's nature. But for you, that's your nature. You might want to hear what this Galatians has to say. Because he's talking to those who are pretty good at keeping the rules. And they're keeping the rules now in the Christian church that were rules from the past... And they're keeping these rules and they're using them to look down on those who don't have these rules or don't keep these rules. And so it's became, become a place of judgment. And I can relate to that because, look, as I'm walking around the long way to keep off the grass, guess what I'm doing? Why is that fool on the grass? Can't he read? Doesn't he know somebody's got to take care of that grass? And you get what I'm saying. And that's what happens with our faith. And it happens in the church. Guys, this is for the church. This was happening in the church. You had these people who were called Judaizers. We've had this debate for a while. Were they Christians? Were they not? They were Jewish Christians. And yeah, they're missing the point. But they, they, they had turned to faith in Jesus Christ. But they're adding something to it. Guys, that happens in the church every day. That happens in my life every day. As a rule follower who's most free when he's rule breaking, I'll admit that. But as a rule follower, I'll look, at, I'll look at certain things and I will gravitate to those. Guys, the five major religions, right, in the, in the world, grab, they, they grab onto people who want something to feel like they can do it. They can get themselves to God. Well, I say five, but even Christianity can become a religion, if it's not based on faith in Jesus Christ alone. And so, guys, I, I know we're serious here this morning. I'm feeling a lot of emotion up here in the front. But this is the illustration that came to my mind from a movie called Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I'm mowing the other day, and I'm like, Jeff's already ahead of me. And there, there was a moment in that movie where Jim Carrey, love that guy, and he's sitting there with the girl that is his love interest in the story, but there's no recipro- like she's no re- nothing reciprocal. And he's trying to find out if they have any chance of connecting, getting together. And her answer, he says, what are the chances? And she says, not good. <laughs> and he, he, can't, he can't get it, right? He just hears her say that and looking for the next opportunity, he says, so what are you saying, not good, like as in one in a hundred? As if that would be enough for him, right? And she says, well, more like not good in the sense of like one in a million. And he goes, okay. So what you're saying is there's still a chance. And he gets all excited, right? And we're in the movie, you laugh and you're like, yeah. And if you've never had that experience in your life, I'm going to say, I don't know if you really ever truly lived. Like that, I was thinking about that quote too. And I was like, okay, yeah, I've been there. I understand. But what I was going to say is now that experience in 
faith. Let's translate that. I know it's a funny story, but what, how, how, how silly is that in the church that you've been told by the law, the first verse that Joe read this morning, verse 21, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? Because guess what the law said? You've got no chance outside of God's work. You've got no chance to save yourself. Not one in a hundred, not one in a million, zero chance. No one's good but God. No one can save you but God. And we have a part to play, and that's the part with Galatians. We have to continue to remind Christians we have a response. We have a part to play. But the salvation, the winning of salvation is all done through the spotless Lamb of God. That was in the songs today, guys. I didn't even know, I really didn't know what songs we were singing today. And I'm reading those things like you as prayers. And I'm like, that's beautiful. Thank you, God. Thank you for reminding me as I go up here to preach. So guys, that's what it's like to be what Paul is writing to. He's already made his appeal. He's already made his case. He gets to this point here and he says, you guys that desire to be under the law, do you even listen to the law? Because you're still acting like there's a chance that if you're circumcised, that if you follow the Jewish law to to a T, if you do these things ceremonially, that somehow that's going to help you be saved. You've missed the point. And guys, it's easy to put this off on something in the first century context and forget this is still going on 2,000 years later in the church. Guys like me that see a science says keep off the grass and we're going to keep off the grass and we're going to look down on others that don't, still do this in the church. I confess to the men of men's Bible study, in my nature, it's still a tendency to judge other people, judge other Christians. It's in me, guys. You may not feel it, and that's by the grace of God. That's because his spirit's working in my life if you don't feel it. But when you feel it, that's sin in me. That's not God. That's not his spirit. That's sin in me. And sin looks for anywhere to get, it can to get a foothold in us. And it gets a foothold in the church this way when we think, yeah. Some of this has to do with my own righteousness. Some of this has to do with my ability to keep the rules. Some of this has to do with me uh, agreeing with God. And I want you guys to hear that. That's like being dumb and dumber. I know it's simple, but I want you to see that's what's going on in the church today. It's like dumb and dumber. And we're, and we're looking at the first part this week, and I get to preach next week, and that'll be like the sequel. I haven't even seen the sequel. But it's like dumb this week and dumber next week, what we're going to be talking about here. I kid you not. But guys, and as I say that, I'm the one it's speaking to. Because my confession of men's Bible study led to the walking point as I was facilitating. And you know what the walking point was? I'm still hearing this word from Paul. You're never done as a Christian as long as you're living in these feet of clay in this life. Until you're in that new Jerusalem, you're still hearing from Paul. You still need to hear this. I need to hear this. Because I can return to that dumbness. I can return in an instant to, I think maybe there is a chance I can do something in this to save myself. And the sin creeps in in those moments. So as we look here, Paul is saying, if you've listened to the law, you should know. And he says, verses 22 and 23, that it's written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman, one by a free woman. Now, if you didn't get a chance to read Joe Grapple's email this week, I would encourage you to go back and look at that email because it gives you some, a little more in depth of some things that I might not get to here today, but explaining how Abraham, even Abraham started to take it in his own hands. And that story, you gotta go do some background reading in Genesis to understand. Again, I don't have time today to cover all that. But you need to go back and read those things so you can understand how these legalizers, these Judaizers, and these Christians in Galatia had been swept up under these teachings about Abraham, missing the point. That all of this was to point to Abraham's need for a God to save him, a covenant with a one who's better than himself, a force outside himself to save him from himself, right? And here we have it in 22 and 23, the next part of that, 23. But the son of the slave woman was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. That's really the point of this little part right here. Before we go into the allegory and everything else, it's just understanding that Paul has already made this point in the first four chapters, You don't want to be 
the one who's born of the flesh. What that means is through human merit, through human effort, you're seeking to be born unto God. How is a Christian born unto God? They're born again through the spirit of God. Jesus had this conversation with Nicodemus. And he had to actually say to Nicodemus, it's not that you, because he's Nicodemus, when he said, you must be, when Jesus said, you must be born again, Nicodemus said, what do I have to do? How do I go back into my mother's womb? Like, how's that work and be born again? And, and Jesus was like, it's not that. It's being born by water and the spirit. Jesus was trying to get him to understand there's a spiritual, supernatural birth that God does in the life of a Christian when they turn to faith in him, Jesus, as their savior and their king. So as he says these things in 22 and 23, he's just reiterating the difference between one born according to the flesh and one who's born through promise. Well, the one born according to the flesh is born to a slave woman. The one who's born into the promise is born by a free woman. Now, the reason I say those things is we're going to build on that is that you need to understand the difference. Because guess what these Israelites in the church believe, these Jewish Christians believe? They believed that they were the ones who were born into the promise because they were children of Abraham. And they were children of Abraham on the side of Sarah. And who was the free woman? Sarah. Who was the one who was slave woman? Hagar. These, is, these Jewish Christians knew this. They knew it like the back of their hand. When they hear Paul talk about this stuff, they immediately think, what's he talking about? We are the children of the promise because we're born and part of the bloodline of Abraham and Sarah. And I want you to hear that so that you understand how scandalous what Paul says next is. But it's really basic to a spiritual understanding. Because guess what? Paul isn't the first ones to say everything that we've read so this morning. You remember John the Baptist? You remember how John the Baptist was constantly telling the Pharisees that they're not sons of Abraham? These are sons of Abraham. <laughs> they're bloodline Jews. But he's saying you're not if you're going against the things of God. You're going against the promises of the Messiah to come, those kind of things. And he was trying to make that distinction himself. Jesus himself does this with the Pharisees. Doesn't matter where you were born biologically. It's a spiritual birth. Nicodemus, I just mentioned earlier, Pharisee. So don't just think Pharisees, no hand, no chance, no hope. Guys, I'm a Pharisee if you listen to what I said in the beginning in the sense that I'm a rule follower. My job at the fire department is to make sure people are following the rules as a code enforcement officer. So that's what I do. But that's spiritually not what I'm to understand about how God is working in my life to save me, to save you, and to save the world. You see, God is the ultimate one to keep the rules. And guess how he did it? Let's just jump to the end. The good news, he did it through Jesus. He fulfilled all the rules. He fulfilled all of the law. Paul has explained that in these first four chapters. That through Jesus, these things are all done. So why now would we add something lesser? Why would we go back to an old covenant? And that's what the point he's going to try to make as he flips this thing on its head and basically starts to call these Jewish lineage people the sons of Hagar, the children of Hagar. It's not true. It, he's trying to say spiritually it's true. And guys, he's not the first one because you know how I named John the Baptist and Jesus, guess who else did this with Israel? Not, the, not Galatian church, but in the Old Testament, every major prophet. Every major prophet referred to Israel in these ways, saying you've forsaken your first love. I'm using different language. But they make it clear that you've turned from God to false idols. You've turned your hearts far from him. And guess what God's response was in each moment? But he's chasing after you. You tell me which one's effort matters the most. And those were the life-changing things. As the prophet spoke these words, then people's hearts are changed because they recognize, oh, we, we have something better to look forward to. And it's this God who provides the way and the promise. 
So he uses an illustration from the Old Testament, from the law. Guys, when you hear the law, we've been saying that a lot. And I don't know. I kept thinking this as I've been hearing the law in here. Are, is, are people starting to think we're talking about the Illinois statute? Are we talking about the civil statutes? Are we talking about? No. Are we talking about keeping off the grass? No. When they heard the law, they're thinking of the Old Testament law, the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah. And you could even extend that, right, to the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, the law would be jumbled in there with the prophets because all those writings of the Old Testament would be understood as amplifying what God's law, what his heart is. So when we say law, we're talking about the way that God has revealed himself to the Israelites and the things that he gave them to point to a Messiah. So what Paul does, he takes an illustration from the Old Testament of Hagar and Sarah, and he takes that illustration from the law, the Torah, that he uses that. Paul turns it allegorical. And he says that here. He actually says in verse 24, now this may be interpreted allegorically. So Paul turns it allegorically. And what he does that is he does it in a way to include the Israelites or the Judaizers in that church as born of Hagar. I think we've explained that enough. And so Paul does this. And here's the point I want to get to for me as I'm reading that and I'm trying to look at it from a Judaizer position and, you know, the Christian, the, the Galatian Christian and how these things work. But, guys, you got to remember that these Galatian Christians were in some way starting to become themselves Judaizers. Even though they weren't Jewish Christians, they're Galatian Christians who think, yeah, you got to be circumcised too. You got to do these other things too. We'll talk about that next week. But these guys are starting to become Judaizers as they teach someone else. This is what is required. So everybody needs to hear this story so they don't think there's another way outside of faith in Jesus Christ alone. And he goes into this allegory about Sarah and Hagar. And guys, here's what I want you to hear in this, because you've heard it, you can read it. I feel like I could spend, I'll, I'll just say a lot of words for a long time. But I ask God, speak through me what you want to say. And here's what I'll start with. When I was in men's Bible study this week, I asked guys to share the role of their moms in their lives. What, what kind of shaping role did a mom have in your life? And men shared such good, there was some, some stories in there and just some examples from their lives of just the way that these women in their lives had poured in. Those were words that were used, poured into them, sacrificed so that they could have things that their moms didn't get to have. And there were so many other things. Taught them to be independent. Taught them. There was just so much stuff read to them. Stories of hope. Stories of salvation. Stories about God. Guys, these are powerful things that moms get to do in the lives. You, you, you have shaped this church, moms. You have shaped this church. Right now with the kids that are in the back, some of you are younger moms. You have shaped this church as you have shaped into the lives of those children. Moms, I'm speaking to moms out there outside this church. My own mom have shaped this church as she poured into me and affirmed the teachings of Jesus Christ through her own life and love in my life. My mom and I will disagree on a thousand things of scriptural interpretation, but one thing we know, and she's passed, I watched her. I listened to her. She she affirmed identifying with Jesus' life and his purpose. Jesus' love for me and his purpose for my life. She, had, she, she, she did that. She affirmed that. I was thinking this week as I'm in this, like, how blessed was I to have a free woman as my mom? And when I'm saying free woman, I mean a woman who knew Jesus. And if you know Jesus, you are free. If you know Jesus, proclaim Jesus to your children, you are a free mom. You are a free dad. And that's the kind of person we want to be in Christ. Now, I know this is an allegory. I just want to set that tone because, guys, how precious are our moms? There was no one in that room that when somebody shared about their mom was like, well, let me tell you about your mom. No. <laughs> we even said we didn't want it to get into, hey, my mom can do better than your mom, right? That, we didn't want to get into that. But I know there's pride in every one of us for whoever it was that poured into us in a maternal way. It's no less for these Judaizers. So hear me. Here's the point. When Paul says this, that you are, you, the, 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 the Jewish Christians are actually sons of Hagar, 
a slave woman? Guys, is it that big a deal to say, hey, your mom's a servant? Is that that big a deal? No, you can call my mom a servant. I'd probably be like, yeah, she got a servant's heart. <laughs> call her a slave? Hmm. Yeah, we're getting touchy now. I want to go. This is a big deal. Guess what Paul calls their mom? A concubine. And that's in the nicest terms, right? As I was thinking about this week, I'm like, what do I say from that pulpit <laughs> about what he's saying about their mom? Guys, but you need to hear why Paul's saying it. He's saying, you've decided to be children of the slave of Hagar, the one who we know was Abraham's concubine. He's turned this into something where they are going to take offense to this immediately. But guys, this is what he's trying to point out. In Christ, you don't have to be that. Now, none of us got to choose our mom. Our moms bore us. That's why Paul says he's speaking allegorically. Because he knows this isn't really their mom. But spiritually, they're living like they're sons of a slave woman, sons of a concubine, prostitute, however you want to put it. And that's how they're living spiritually. When truly in Christ, they've been born of the free woman and they're children of promise. It's a respectable, honorable place to be. And I want you to hear that because that's what these guys are dealing with. And Paul's turned it on his head for these men who thought they could stand in their own Jewish identity. He's reminding them that any good that's in them is a gift from God. He goes on to say in verses 26 and 27, but the Jerusalem above is free. If you were here for the call to worship, you heard us talk about the new Jerusalem. It's an amazing thing to look forward to and hope in. It's no more crying, no more tears, perfect peace, eternal peace with God, perfect harmony, perfect unity, everything that's perfect. Guys, we don't know perfection here, but you've known tastes of it. So take that to its fullest, and that's what heaven, that's what the new Jerusalem is. But here's what he wants to make clear. It's not about what that's going to feel like. He wants to make clear what it is, and he says in verse 26, the Jerusalem above is what? Free. Free. This book is about freedom. This book is about walking free and not letting anyone's false teachings enslave us. I want to say this really quick before I go any further because this happens all the time. False prophets in this world take the scriptures that are here and they will turn them and they will make them allegorical. That's what Paul did. But Paul says, I'm speaking allegorically. You'll have preachers and teachers, false teachers, who will take things from scripture, turn it allegorically, and it's not meant to be turned allegorically. And they'll use it to put their thumb on you and control you. Guys, here's how you know it's the gospel. When it sets you free... Not enslaves you, sets you free. Some say, well, Paul referred to himself as a slave of Christ Jesus. And as a slave of Christ Jesus, he was free. Anyone who knows Jesus knows that's what that means. Not that he was somehow brought into new bondage. You've been set free in Christ, but yet you're indebted to him. Guys, I sit here this morning, there's not a thing God can't ask me to do in that moment that I'm like, I'm all yours. That's where I want to live, not in that pew, but in that state. That's the anointing of the Holy Spirit that is available to us 24-7, 365 days a year. That's walking free. That's not being held to my passions, my idols, my comfort, my control, my power, my acceptance. No, that's being led by the Spirit of God, knowing I'm safe in his arms. I'm, I have found my refuge. I have found my resting place. I'll do anything. I'm here for you, God. That's, that's him driving my affections. That's him changing me from the inside out. So when he says this, Jerusalem is above is free, it's a strong statement. And then guess the next statement. And she is our mother. So who's our? It's every Christian. So as you heard me say this, one thing is hard when you talk about Jewish Christians or Israelites or any of this, is who in the audience starts to hear that? Is, and this has happened in the church that it starts to sound anti-Semitic. 
And this is what I want to make clear. This is not against Jews. This was not against somehow a nation. This is against that spiritual state in our lives that's so hard to say, I think I can save myself. And it's a call to repentance to say you need Jesus. And so, guys, here's what you need to hear about whatever place. I named five religions in the beginning and five major religions. Look, no matter where anybody's at in this life, you should be loving and praying for those people that their hearts would turn to Jesus. If you're free in Christ, you want others to experience freedom in Christ. And guys, sometimes we're still trying to strap them into or enslave them into our philosophical mindset. That's not what this gospel evangelism means. It means spread the good news that freedom has come and his name is Jesus. That's what we're about. That's what we do. And we never give up on any human being. Even when we give up, we say, God, I believe, help my unbelief. Help me to pray for my brother. Help me to pray for my sister. Wait, you called him a brother and sister? I did. Because I believe everybody that sits around me in this life, even my enemies in this life, territorial enemies, whatever you want to call it, state enemies, I have a responsibility to still be praying for them because I know at any moment God is going to move on this Christian's heart in the ways that will glorify him, not myself. So even as a former soldier, Whatever my role is now in so many different ways, I'm still praying, and it's complicated. It's complicated, and I can't give you all the answers, and you can't give me all the answers, but guess who can? The Spirit of God, His Word of truth in any situation. That's why we preach that, not some, here's the prescription for living this this week. You want to know what my two points were? Who's your mom, and how were you born? So we talked about who's your mom, how big a deal that is, right? That's a big deal. Well, guess what the next thing Paul wants to make clear? How you were born. So he goes on to it, verse 27. For it is written, rejoice, O barren one. Look at these words, O barren one. That's a helpless position. Cannot bear a child who do. It's not just O barren one. He says, O barren one who do, does not bear. Add insult to injury. O barren one who does, does not bear. And then he goes on to say, But he says rejoice and then break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. Is it a coincidence that tomorrow's Labor Day? The word labor's in, I don't know. that, That statement there is wild. But that's the Christian gospel. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. This, you who are barren and do not bear. You who cry aloud, but you're not able to to perform labor. Guys, that's, that's the cry of the Christian heart. The follower of Jesus Christ has come to a place where they said, I am helpless. I am barren. He's going to go on to say it. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, verse 27. Keep going. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Guys, it takes everything I have right there because I've sat in this all week not to run around this church at that point. If you think that's crazy, I'm going to tell you why that's the response in my heart. I can't do enough of this. Woo! In that moment. Because he's taken the desolate one. He's taken the desolate one and he's performed a miracle. He's done a work in my life where I stand in faith and I'm able to raise my hand and say, I'm one of his children. I'm one of those that he's redeemed. I'm one of those he's set free from slavery. I'm one of those who no longer lives in Bajo. I'm one of those who gets to be called son of God. I'm one of those who gets to cry, Abba, Father, in prayer. I'm the one who gets to know him intimately in that way. I'm the one who's free, not by the tongue and, and, and temptations of the enemy, but I'm free in Christ. And that's how I felt. It's like, you can't help it. You're just like, yeah, that, that deserves some exclamation. That deserves some kind of expression of amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah. You know, all the different exclamations you can give that, that from your heart are a true cry of astoundment and wonder at what God has done. And so when I say, how were you born? It's just the same thing as Paul saying here in verse 28. Now you brothers like Isaac are children of promise. I wanted you to hear that language earlier that Paul refers himself with them as a child of promise. He refers to himself with them as a child of the free woman. Guys, that's available to everyone. That's available to the Judaizers. In that moment, it's available. No one has to continue to believe or stay in that state of spiritual slavery, spiritual bondage, spiritual being played. 
They don't have to stay there. Jesus has provided a better way, a place of honor, a place with him, a place of sonship, inheritance, a place of, 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 of nobility. Guys, we don't even think like that in terms of Christians a lot of times and followers of Christ. It's, it's a place of honor to be with Jesus. And he says, now you brothers, this is him too, right? Calling them brothers. Like Isaac, our children of promise. So here you go. He points to Isaac. Who is Isaac? Isaac is Abraham's son. How was Isaac born? You didn't think I had a point when I said, how were you born? How was Isaac born? Did they talk to the OBGYN, figure out, you know? A, no, no. She's beyond that. She's a barren one, Sarah. Born by the supernatural miracle of God in Sarah's life to have her conceive this son. Abraham and Sarah conceived because of the supernatural power of God in their lives. It was a miracle of faith that they were able to trust in that, believe that. Although we do see Abraham, his faith is tested and he fails because he and not just him, Sarah, that was her idea. Sound familiar, Garden of Eden stuff? Sarah and Abraham come up with this idea, you can be with Hagar and we'll figure this out on our own. Are you seeing why Paul's using that language? It was not to rip the church apart. It wasn't to create some classism, racism. It was to make clear, guys, what are you doing? Even with Abraham, this started. With Isaac, this started as a child born of promise. That God fulfilled the promise. That was what he wants them to hear. So why are you going back and being like that? Why are you acting like you're going to come up with your own plan to ensure your salvation? We talked about allegories earlier, and I do want to mention one that's very popular. And I've had my son read this, and I would encourage you to read this if you haven't. At some point, as a developing Christian, I think it's very helpful to have this allegory along with reading the Bible. But for your spiritual journey... And the allegory is called Pilgrim's Progress. And the reason I say that, and guys, maybe you're not a reader. You can go watch a movie about it. Whatever you got to do to get this visual in your mind. Because, guys, we go through all these different things. And that allegory helps us see, oh, all these things kind of work in life. And it just kind of helps us to understand conceptually how the Christian's life is not just a straight and narrow. There's all these twists and turns and characters along the way. So... In that story of Pilgrim's Progress, guess what the main character is called? Christian. <laughs> Pretty simple, right? John Bunyan wrote this. I don't know, man, very creative. He says he had this in a dream, and then he wrote these things out. But here's what gets me. Christian, that's not real creative, if you ask me. It wasn't meant to be. It was meant to be very straightforward to understand that's the Christian. He's the one who's walking through. And guys, there were other Christians in the story who weren't called Christian, but they represented Different friends along the way that God uses in our lives or different martyrs, different people, different things that happen along the way. And it's a really good story that I want to encourage. So allegory can be used in good ways like Paul does here, Paul, like John Bunyan does in Pilgrim's Progress with that book. It's just uh, describing, like this story is describing a spiritual journey for followers of Jesus Christ. There's characters called heedless and temporary. There's other characters who are called faithful and there's, there's so many. There's just the whole list of characters. Really not. They just express different concepts. But here's the part I wanted you to get. I wrote down heedless and temporary because one of the things that Paul says next in verse 30 is he says, cast out the slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. And just before that in 29, that he talks about being persecuted by him who was born according to the flesh. Guys... Do not miss the point here. Do not turn this into some geopolitical conversation. Paul is talking to Christian church. He's talking to Christian church. And when he says this, he's making it very clear that this is about a spiritual dilemma that's going on. And there's going to be persecution within the church. The reason I say that is because all of a sudden we read this and it's like us versus them. Guys, we got so much work to do in here. And guess what? When I say in here, guess where it's coming right back to? In here. Got so much work to do right here. This heart, this battleground, God's continually redeeming, claiming, captivating, 
all inspiring. All that work that God's doing, he needs to do that in you. He needs to do that in us. And then the world will know by our love for one another. But guys, here's the thing. This persecution that's going on in the churches in Galatia is coming from within. These guys are like half brothers fighting against each other. But in Christ, they're like full brothers. And they're, and they're, they're hurting each other. And this is what we need to understand is that the church will continually deal with persecution from outside, but we got to take seriously inside. And when I say take seriously inside, guess what that doesn't mean? This grass, not walk on the grass guy. That doesn't mean that I walk around being like, who's the persecutor? It means I look inside and I say, God, help me not to be the one persecuting. Help me not. And start with you. Don't worry about the rest of us. Start with you. This place should be the most welcoming, the most easily accessible. This should be the the biggest tent area for anybody, whatever you believe. Because in Christ, we are free. So their stuff can't get off on me. Matter of fact, I can go into the midst of anything if God's spirit directs me. And I'm free to walk. I'm a light. The darkness flees. It doesn't get on me. And that's a, such a freeing thing to know, that we can live like that in Christ. So I shared a few of those things. Uh, it talks about casting out, as I mentioned in verse 30. I just want to say real quick, I believe that can be interpreted a lot of different ways. Here's what I would say for Christians today, for Christians in the church. Instead of casting someone out who, who, who we feel like is, again, don't be divisive in the church. There's false teachings in the church. It's important to make sure... True teaching, the, the word of God's being taught. All, all I want to say on that is just test the spirits. Be discerning, right? I said anybody's welcome in here, but not everybody is, not everybody's speaking, right? Not everybody's getting a lot of platform. But guys, when you come to my men's Bible study experience, when you come to these group experiences, you can talk. Anybody can talk. We've said that over and over. Anybody can say what they want to say. And here's what we trust at the end of the day, that the spirit of God We'll draw the pendulum where it needs to be. And that brings so much freedom for this guy to trust that I could be one on 25. And the spirit of God is going to lead it to the truth. And we, we start in the word and we hang in the word and we, groups that are healthy are going to stay in the word. Because that's going to be ultimately, because this guy, one on 25, could be the one wrong. And the word's going to bring us back. And that's going to be really important. So we don't get led off by some false teaching. So I just want to give you guys that test the spirits, be discerning, know what is false, know what is true. And that's what Paul's trying to say here. Know what is true and hold on to the truth. Hold on to the truth. You're born children of the promise. Why are you throwing in for something else? Hold on to the truth. Guys, that is a, that is the active part we play. That is the part you and I have to do. We remember what God's done for us, and then we walk holding on to that truth. And I'm going to give you an example of that from my life. When I was a kid, I played football with a guy who was a year younger than me, and his dad's name was Freeman. And when Freeman, I used to deliver papers before my friend and I played football together, and I would have to go collect for the paper route. And there was a Wilmoth edition that was down where I played baseball, and I remember riding my bike going to Freeman's house and asking him for the money, pay me the money, whatever, and we'd go, and I'd have to go around that area. But here's what I want to tell you about Freeman. I'm, I'm dense. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that smart when it comes to stuff. I, the obvious in front of me, I miss it all the time. But because I had that paper, I guess what I saw, his name, and it finally made sense. I, I was just always saying Freeman. Well, Mr. Bacon, for me at that time, wasn't going to say his last name. But I would just say his, but I would always just think it was Freeman. Until I'm reading it on paper and I'm like, oh, his mama named him that for a reason. Free man. She named him that for a reason. Now, the friend I had, his son, he walked like a free man by the grace of God. I don't know what free man's, free man's experience was like all the way. I, I know what I experienced and saw, and I don't know if he ever got to fully realize that name. Here's why I said that. I'm not trying to bring up any weird stuff. I'm trying to say how important was it to that mom, that dad, whoever gave the name, that he know his identity is a free man. 
And guys, years later, I'm like, that's pretty cool. Well, guess what? I'm coming into this message, and I'm like, I can't get that out of my head. Because here we go. We're supposed to live like our name is, free man, free woman, in Christ Jesus and by his spirit. That's what Paul wants them to understand. You are not the child of the slave. You are not the child of the concubine. You are the child of promise that God did the miracle in and created this supernatural born again experience where my spirit testifies with your spirit that you are my child and you are an heir of God and free to walk today in that truth. So when I say hold on to the truth, guys, guess what I'm saying? You need to name yourself. You need to know who you are. And guess what my name is? Christian. Now, I say that in this world, and guess what? A whole bunch of weird stuff comes up. I'm not kidding. It is a shame. But when I say it to myself, you are a Christian. I am in Christ. That's what that name is, in Christ. Guys, that is the power of God that lets me walk free. You don't think that demons and, and, and spiritual satanic forces don't attack this hard? And you know what my prayer is? It sounds stupid to the world, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave this space. This isn't your home. This is the home of my Savior and King. And guys, and then I still have to do the work of praying and saying, God, what's going on? What am I looking for? Come and meet me. Let me see that you're coming to meet me. Fill my heart with what I want, what I need. Let me see with spiritual eyes, not with just eyes of flesh. And God does an amazing work in me, guys. To this day, I stand here by his grace and his glory with victory after victory. And I thank God for that. So, guys, this is the good news in closing. This is it. This is, this is the thing that you want to hold on to. We, too, can be children of promise. I talked about Isaac. I want to go a little bit further with identifying with Isaac. For you that know the story, it's good to hear it again. For you that don't know the story, you need to hear it. Abraham, it's complicated to understand how the whole thing worked, but Abraham, been given this blessing from God through faith. He has this experience of having this child that wasn't supposed to be there. And what's he get asked to do? Put him on an altar. <laughs> and everybody's like, oh my gosh, God is so evil and cruel. Well, read the Bible. He's not. He's the most gracious force in existence. And you know, what, you know what God does in that moment when Abraham puts Isaac on the altar and Isaac's like, what, what are you doing? And he does, it's so confused, but guess what God does? Just as it looks like it's the moment of finality for Isaac to be sacrificed on this altar, God delivers a ram, a replacement sacrifice. And he says to Abraham, do not do that. For I've provided a lamb for the sacrifice. Now, guys, here's why it's not cruel. Because you and I are looking at it like, oh, boy, what, what, what kind of trauma for Isaac? What kind of trauma for? I'm going to tell you now, life happens. Life happens and God speaks. Don't be hiding from all the bad things. And you miss out on the, the good word of God that comes from it. I stand here today as a result of much trauma, much things, much hardship, much struggle, much pain. And that only makes me know the word of God more. It only makes me know the love of God more. Do not hide your children from that. Let them know God is real and God is good. And he shows up just in time, every time. So here's what happens in that moment. Isaac sees this. You don't think Isaac doesn't tell his story to his friends? You don't think Isaac doesn't tell his mom? You don't think Isaac don't talk about that for a long time? What was wrong with dad? And that's okay. He should say that. And then what does Abraham say? He gives a name to God, Jehovah Jireh. God will provide. You want to talk about faith? You want to talk about a man who's just put everything that he's waited for on the altar, only to have God say, I'm going to give it right back to you, only it's going to be even better. Because when you get it back, you're going to know this. I got your back all the way through. And guys, that's not done. That's not done. That would be something to clap for if that was the end of the story. Yeah, sure. But there's something to stand up and scream about. And that's this, that God said, what you saw with Isaac, just a taste. Just a taste of what I'm getting ready to do through my son, Jesus. And he sent Jesus, the perfect lamb, at just the right time. 
and save me. He sent Jesus, the perfect lamb, as a sacrifice in your place at just the right time. That is good news. Not for the one who's the rule follower who still thinks maybe I, there's still a chance. But for the one who's come to the place to say, I got no hope. I'm desolate. I'm barren. I don't know what's going to go. I, guys, that's a gift to know now that you need to look for your salvation from the only one that can give it, God the provider. And he's promised it through Jesus Christ. Now, if that's the end of the story, that's one thing. But it's not the end of the story. He saved this boy, but he's still saving this boy, this man. And he's still saving me on into eternity where now I'll be home forevermore. And guys, I want you to understand that's part of the story. That's that pilgrim's progress. That's the work that God's doing to grow us, to sanctify us. And you know why he does that? So I'm not weird in this life and I can't talk to other human beings. My life goes through those things. You know what? Because now I have a human connection with other human beings to talk about. Yeah, that is hard. And not to pie in the sky, but to be like, I can relate here. And I can tell you how God worked in my life here. And even as people share their stuff with me, I'm like, thanks for sharing that. Because you remind me God provides. So even in 13 days till a wedding, to remember and to know and things like that, God will provide. And guess what that does? It sets this old dad free to be able to enjoy what God has given. Man, the harder I hold on tight, the more enslaved I am. But the more I can let go and let God, the greater it is for me and those who are around me to experience the promises being fulfilled through God in Christ Jesus. So it's powerful stuff, guys. It's available for you today. Here's the good news. The cross, the resurrection, it's real. It's true. Jesus has done it. He's fulfilled it. You have proof. An empty grave. You have proof. A cross he took. These things are proof that God loves you. These are the things we're supposed to hear. Just like free man and Christian, we're to hear cross, empty grave. When we go through the dark night of the soul, we're to hear those things so that we remember we're not alone. God didn't leave the room. God is with us. He's for us. And he's still working for us. And he gets the last word. And the cross and the resurrection are the greatest living hope that we have today. No sad movie can undo that. No death in this life can undo that. No hardship can undo that. Because in due time, God will get the last word. And it's an eternal word. And there was one verse that we didn't mention in this passage yet. But it was the verse where Paul quotes Isaiah 54. You come back next week. And we're going to talk some more about why that's such a powerful thing for him to quote. Because he's talking about the eternal peace of God. But I think I have went long enough today. So I'm just going to ask you this. How will you respond to this good news? That now we identify with Isaac. We need a savior God has provided through Jesus Christ. Why would we add anything to it? You're invited to receive it today. I'm going to invite you whenever we uh, worship team can come forward, whenever they begin to play. I'm going to be down front for just, the, I'm not going to be there forever unless the Lord holds me there. But I'm going to be there for a moment. Maybe you need somebody to pray with. Maybe God's put something on your heart. I just want to remind you of this. You're not alone. Even as this worship team comes up here, I said greeting team, security team. Did you hear me say team? Did you know that is what God intends for you to know? Is you are not alone. And everybody hears that and is like, yeah, I got God now. You got God's people. You got God's family. You got the love of God being shown through the hands and feet of Jesus. And I just told my daughter this the other day. And that's not, that, that gives me hope that we're not perfect. I told her, you speak all you want into my life. And don't think you got to be perfect to say it. Because every time you speak, it's just a sign of your love in my life. And I'm telling you that today because some of you think you can't say it because you're not perfect. That makes you more qualified to say it to the person next to you. You speak out of a place of need. And if you know the one who's met that need, share that with those who are in need. And that's what you're invited to receive today. The one who meets your needs, Jesus Christ. So as we stand, as you sing,
you're invited to respond this morning, however God leads you.
cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. sacred space to let God work for us to rest in his work then also trusting to respond and take the step of faith to how he calls us to respond and to step out in faith I'm so thankful for the way he's worked in my life and he's reminded me time and time again that he's not done with me Know the voice of truth. It's Jesus. Know his spirit. It's, it's truth. It's all truth. And hold tightly to those things. Jesus and his spirit of truth. And he will prevail. I heard this week in my heart as I prayed, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. Because gates, that's something we go into. Gates don't come against us. If you hold to Jesus, hold to the truth that he declares over you, you ain't hanging out at the gates of hell. He's taking you into the way everlasting. He's taking you into that abundant life that he's called you to. He's taking you where he wants you to be in the gates of hell. They do not prevail against it. I'm hopeful. I'm grateful. And I thank God for his work. I got a benediction. I ask you to receive that with me this morning. God, our dear Father, remind us again whose we are and what you promised to do. What you promised to do for us in Christ Jesus, our Savior and King. May we hold to that truth as if our lives depend on it. And by this truth, transform our lives and transform our world. Transform these things for you to be known, for you to be glorified. Amen. You go in peace.